Okay, let's pray together. Here we go. Father, we worship you. Yes. Amazing God, holy God, awesome and wonder and works. Yes. And Lord, we thank you as you have showed us, Lord, and as we are living at this time in history, to see the wonder of your works, your wisdom, your grace to us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who inspired your word, for the spirit of truth who leads us into all truth, <clears throat> because you are truth. And so we ask, oh God, come in the name of Jesus today as we look at this particular study, these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our hearts to see, to believe, to be transformed, Lord, to be become more and more like Jesus. We bind Satan in any way he would seek to hinder us, blind us to the truth of who you are, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> and just now we pray, bring about the manifestation of your grace to us in Jesus. So we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're looking at uh, Acts 15. Now, sometimes I'll just say this too on the handout. It says number 12. But that's my notation. It's the 12th class in this series. It's not on Acts 12, because sometimes people will, will think that. But we're looking at Acts 15, and the focus of the study today records, first of all, A, the rise of theological dif differences and debate, then the issue coming to a head and being addressed in what is called the Jerusalem Council. And then see the resolution of the matter with a statement of the conclusion and application to the churches. Now, what goes on here in Acts 15, you know, we can kind of look at it one way or another and kind of look at ancient history, whatever. But what's significant, important for church history is that this particular event and what is recorded in this event becomes precedent <clears throat> for all future councils. And historically, there are what are called ecumenical councils. That means ecumenical means the whole church. Now, fundamentally, in the church, there are historically, depending on how you want to look at it, the Eastern branch, the Western branch, you had Eastern Orthodox, Western in Rome, out of Rome came the Protestant church. But all of the branches, and some just go, we're independent, we don't have anything to do with those guys. Anyway. Uh, all of them go back like a tree trunk, all right? They all go back. You've got different branches, you know, big trunks that are going out in different branches. But all of them ultimately go back to the ecumenical councils, all right? Uh, they, and this is 325 Ni Nicaea, which dealt with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the Trinity. And that's why we, for example, uh, in the season, we'll recite the Nicene Creed that talks about who Jesus is, his person, uh, the Creed of Constantinople, uh, which then began to deal with how the person of Christ being God and man, two complete natures in one person, how they lived in unity in one person, all right? And that's what that council dealt with, among many other things. So all these go back to this, uh, what took place here in this original council is called the Jerusalem Council. And as I say there, it is important to understand that every generation has issues which arise out of the contemporary culture that are dividing the church and must be addressed. Now, the reason I mention that, emphasize that is because, for example, I hear people say, well, why are people so focused on, let's go back, you know, general, abortion? You know, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that that's where the assault is in the church. It's now, uh, you know, your identity, transgender identity or homosexuality or these things, because it's not that the church is obsessed with that. That's where the war is. You know, that's where the, the battle is. So you just go back in history uh, to particular issues. Uh, that, are, that are dealt with. Now, ultimately, in one way or another, the foundational fundamental cause of controversy and disagreement 
always goes back to authority. Ultimately, everything goes back to authority, period. I don't care where you are, what area of life you're in, it goes back to authority one way or another. <clears throat> so specifically in the universe, it's God. But as we look at the church, theological issues, how we live our lives, of course, and ultimately it is this, but it always goes back to the original temptation in Genesis 3.1. Indeed, has God said, or like the old classic King James, indeed, did God say, which can be understood actually in two ways. Okay, depending on, and this is important, a person's belief about the Bible, about the scriptures, the written word of God. Now, first of all, there's, and there's two camps, the liberals and now progressives. And uh, if you have been here in my class enough, you know, I make a distinct difference between a liberal and a progressive. Okay, because it's you can see it manifest. A liberal is a person who believes in freedom. All right. And so that's where America's roots are in. You're free to believe, have denominations, okay, and whatever else. And you're free to do this, free to do that. A progressive goes, no, you have to believe what we want, and we're gonna make laws to make you believe. And if you don't believe what we believe, we're gonna uh, punish you in one way or another. Cancel is a word that's used. And so progressives are basically uh, more active in no longer allowing for freedom and liberty, but to enforce their view upon the culture, upon the society, and, and ultimately the world. And that's you know, basically the manifestation of Satan, the mind of Satan working through whatever means he can and whatever kingdoms and areas to bring about his ultimate rule on earth. So <clears throat> liberals and progressives, the most basic issue is that to one degree or another, they do not believe the scriptures are the word of God to one degree or another. But primarily, if not completely, they're human words. And we are left to our own our own reason, and that's important reason because in the Western Church and really the world, uh, as it came about, it comes about through the Enlightenment, which is really the endarkenment. Okay, and it's all the world's terminology. Enlightenment is when you go back to pagan sources and you become enlightened again. Really, you're just turning away from God. The Renaissance. You know what Renaissance means, by the way? Born again it means born again. What's born again? The pagan culture. It's not Christianity, you know, it's not that. So anyway, so it all goes back to reason. You know, it's no longer revelation from God, and your reason is under the revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit. You're under the Word of God. Now, reason is above what you believe is the Bible. So you go in the Bible, you choose what to believe, what not to believe, or if you believe anything. And so it, this is actually, and this is important too, because most people don't understand this. But this is actually the essence of eating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so some people think that eating at the tree of knowledge of good and evil is just simply experiencing evil. But God says later in Genesis 3, the man has become like us, knowing good and evil. Now, how does God know evil experientially? He doesn't. He is the one who determines what is right, wrong, truth, error, good, and evil. And so whenever people, human beings, put themselves above God in terms of they're the final authority for good, for evil, for right and wrong, they become like God. Not that they are God, but they become like God and they're, they for themselves are the final determiner of right and wrong, truth and error. And you are now above the word of God instead of below the word of God. All right. And so this is uh, basically it. So it's fundamentally humanism, and it's not humanism with a small age, it's humanism with a large age, that humanity is the end and the goal and the judge of all things and fundamentally your reason. All right, now, believing the lie of Satan and not the truth of the word of God, these answer the question, indeed, as God said with, well, not really, you surely won't die. You see, that's what devil said to Adam and Eve. You won't die. And so they believe the word of, of, of Satan and not the word of God. Now, for those who believe this in the scriptures, that they're authoritative written word of God, and this is important, again, you're in the same ballpark, okay? The issue is a matter of interpretation of the word of God. 
The answer to the question, indeed, as God sa said, for these people is yes, and this is what it means. So you're in the same ballpark, but you're arguing, really debating over uh, interpretation. Now, I'm giving you history and uh, right now some very technical terms, but I bring it down to the, uh, you know, basic everyday life. But this is vividly uh, seen in the two primary issues of the Protestant Reformation with A, and this is a technical word, the material principle being the doctrine of justification. Okay, material is like, okay, this is where the battlefield is. We're arguing over this. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what it, the, the, the warfare is about. You know, you have this, a civil war and you go to Gettysburg or whatever you want to go. And so there's where the battle is being fought particularly. But there's an ultimate issue. Okay, that it's about. It's not just the battlefield, it's the ultimate issue. So the material principle, what the issue that arose is how a person is declared righteous before God. All right, whether it is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So it doesn't have anything ultimately to do with your works. And that's a technical phrase. It's the basis. Now, I want to be also here. It does have everything to do with your works in terms of this. You are born of God by grace through faith alone. You're dead in trespasses and sins. You can't make yourself alive. You don't have any work that can generate. If you're a dead man in a grave, you're not going to go, well, I'm going to make myself alive here. That's what we are spiritually. And so God, in his grace, just like he came to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it says, God makes us alive. And that regeneration then results in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It results in our lives being changed so that we believe in truth of who Jesus is. And that belief in truth means he is Lord of my life. I repent. I choose to live for him. We won't be perfect. But because of that, I seek to do, as Ephesians says, good works. We are saved by grace through faith alone. And that is not from you. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can glory or boast. However, it goes on to say, but we are his workmanship, his poem, his work. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Who knows the next statement? Good works. For good works. So the Reformation is we're saved by faith alone, but it is not a faith that is alone. Because if you say, I believe and I don't have works, like James says, sorry, you're not on your way to heaven as far as the Bible is concerned. You know, you need to repent, start reality of living for Jesus, being filled, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, because frankly, the only people in heaven are the ones doing God's will. And if you don't want to, you're going to the other place. That's the way it works. So <clears throat> then the formal principle B there uh, in the issue of the Reformation was what is the authority? So it comes back. And so the reformer said, ultimately, only, finally, it's the word of God. Now, the church, the Roman church said, no, it's the, it's the scriptures, it's the church in its authority, and also its tradition. So these things became the authority so that that understanding of the highest authority then controls how your theology, your view of God, and specifically how you're made right with God is then lived out and what you stand on. All right. <clears throat> now, this is what's going on in Acts chapter 15. The people in the debate here and the controversy are not liberals, okay? These are people who intensely believe the Bible. And uh, that's one of the things I'm concerned about also. I, I don't want to get into that, but often portrayals of, you know, the disciples or whatever are like they're kind of these country bumpkins that go out and don't know. Those people were absolutely, they were intense followers of, of God. Peter James, John, you know, they're a follower, or Peter, not maybe not, but James and John, the others were followers of John the Baptist. You know, they're committed believers. Like when the Holy Spirit <clears throat> or God gave vision to Peter on in Acts 10, he's in a vision and God brings all these animals down and says, take and eat. And what's his response? No way, I've never eaten anything, what? Unclean. This guy's kosher, quote unquote. He's absolutely committed all this time. 
So anyway, these all these people here are committed to what the Bible says. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> no, that's fine. No works go to hell. I heard you say a while ago. No works go to hell. Oh, okay. I understand. If a person doesn't have works, they're on their way to hell. Yeah. Yes. But how do you get around a dead, dead confession? Which I, you know, I've always amazed at. Well, okay. Fundamentally, the answer to that question is the thief on the cross. There's no works. This guy can't do anything. He's right there on the cross. Remember me, Lord, in, when you come into your kingdom. Now, the key thing there is what did he believe and confess? Okay, it wasn't like, well, oh, no, I better, better, you know, save myself. Just forgive me, Jesus. You know, it's like, whatever. It seems to be black and white. Well, it, it, well, the issue is ultimately, did the guy truly believe and truly repent? <clears throat> okay, it's not like it's a deathbed confession and it's really not a true confession and repentance from the heart. Well, absolutely. That is drastically, as anything, shows salvation by grace through faith alone, apart from works. Again, the confession was what? On the cross. What did that thief on the cross say to Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember is covenant language. It's not like, oh, don't forget me, Jesus. This is covenant language. When God brought Israel out, he said, remember, 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 this is my works. And because of what I have done, this is that's what the whole thing about the Lord's Supper in many ways is about. Remember, remember, this is what it's about. But the key thing is your kingdom. When How is a person saved? Romans 10, 8, and 9. If you believe in your heart, that God raised Jesus from the dead and do what? What? Yes. Lord, not Savior. If he's not, if he's not Lord, he's not Savior. People want to make it Jesus my Savior, but he's not my Lord. Well, I mean, you may be living my life, but the Bible doesn't say that you have any hope of salvation if that's really your commitment. I mean, we all fail. Lord is about rule, kingship. There's only two kingdoms in the universe, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan that really is the active power of sin. Salvation, again, when we are born again, Jesus said what? You must be born of God above again in order to what? What? Say it louder. Enter the kingdom. Now, most people nowadays here like go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is talking about. You don't read anything in the book of Acts about people dying and going to heaven. Nothing. It's about your kingdom. What is the prayer in the Lord's in the Lord's prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven. So that we'll go to heaven. No, it's on earth. The kingdom of God is the rule of God. Period. The government of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives and in our hearts. That's what it's about. Everything ultimately in the whole universe is for that purpose. Read Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul says, This is the eternal plan of God before the creation of the world, that God will bring everything in heaven and on earth under the rule, the headship, the lordship of Jesus Christ by his power. That's what God's will is. What is what is God doing now? Uh, Psalm 110, verse 1. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Sit at my right hand, period. You're ruling. He's, you know, this is, again, I'm, I'm getting off on the subject, but this is important. You know, in our culture, how much time do we spend on Christmas? A lot. <clears throat> How much time do we spend on Easter? Well, in the angling church, a little bit more with Lent, but not as much. How much time do we spend on the Ascension? Okay, hardly anything. What? The what? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, now uh, let me ask you this. In if you were in England, all right, which has a kingdom or a queendom, if you want to say that, but rule, what's the most important event in that person's life in regard to the kingdom? Coronation. Coronation. Crowning. Where they ascend officially. That's where Edward, what was it, the eighth or whatever it was, became king, but he's never became crowned. Okay. Elizabeth was crowned. All right, and the whole ceremony is amazing, by the way, how biblical it is being anointed. But the ascension of Jesus Christ is the act in all of history, the universe, that says God is working in and through his son to bring about his will and his kingdom on the earth and in the whole universe. That's why we pray your kingdom come, your rule, your government, your will be done on earth. Now, how does that happen? It happens in the heart, first of all. And the heart being overthrown from rule of sin to rule of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that Jesus is Lord. All right. Now he's Savior then. He saved you from your sin. But he's become Savior because he is now your Lord. Let me ask you this. Who was saved in the ark? No one. <laughs> no one his family. All right. How many people were saved out of the ark? Okay, the only way they got into the ark, which symbolizes Christ, is to obey the word of God. Do what God says. You come to where Christ is. You're in Christ. He becomes your savior, but he is your Lord. You do. No, I don't believe that. No, I believe, no, if Galatians chapter five says, don't live according to the desire of the flesh, but live according to the desire of the spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives us holy good desires to do the, let me ask this, do you want to do the will of God? Yeah, but what's the ultimate desire of your life? No, no, I, I'm asking you, if you were to go, this is the greatest, most important thing in my life that I desire. It's not that Oh, yeah, I desire Christmas presents for my kids. I desire my wife to love me, <clears throat> you know. Well, why are you here? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you. I mean, I believe that the reason you're here, the reason you're asking this question, what we have to know is that the Holy Spirit works, human nature works through desire, period. Okay, desire. A thought comes in your head, you want to do it, or you don't want to do it. You're attracted to it, or you're repulsed by it. What? I'm just giving analytical. Okay, you, you're talking about particulars. Okay, you can go in a store and go, well, there's cucumbers. I love cucumbers, but there's persimmons. I don't like those. Okay, but that operates within you by desire. Now, when we're fallen human beings, we can have the image of God still in us, all right, is this common grace and want, you know, want good government, want God to bless. So those are good desires because it's still the image. But only people who really ultimately go, I want God's will in my life are the ones who are born again of God. And that is tested through life. Okay, it's through your life. It's not a one-time statement. That's why trials testing tribulation comes where peter says that the testing of your faith may prove to be genuine all right so yeah you're you're looking at all your assortment of desires but that's how you operate but the question is and this is our prayer this is really i mean when when we pray your kingdom come your will be done okay i pray it this way because the, the greek word that means will okay is the word that what you desire Okay, you, what God desires, that's really personal. It's not just some sovereign thing of the great beyond, you know, he's got a plan. What God wants, he's a personal being who wants something. What God wants is for us to want what he wants. Amen. That's simple. And so, yeah, well, I mean, there's a whole lot of areas where, you know, I mean, does, it, does God care if I like football or baseball? Well, God bless you. The tree in the garden, God said, you're free to eat whatever you want. That's God's will. 
you know, you like this tree, oranges, lemons, whatever. You got those desires. But this thing, you can't do. So what's the ultimate desire? Are you going to do my will? You're free to do all that other stuff. Or are you going to do my, my will here? And so if you are choosing to do God's will in the midst, and this is, again, New Testament, that is crucifixion. You read Galatians. Those who are in the spirit have crucified the flesh. Now, what does that mean? That means that here I come, I don't know, care whatever, take a sin. Okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'll use pornography. That's a pretty relative one. There it is. Comes up on your computer and, you know, maybe women don't do, but they're more and more that way. They're going that way. But it's like, here's a man, you know, here's a thing. They send something, and you go, there it is. And all of a sudden, what happens? Well, most often, something's activated in you. And probably the devil's hanging around there, too, blowing that. All right. And so what's activated? Okay. It's the power of flesh, sin. Okay. And that is a desire that is an attraction. James talks about this. Sin is lured out. There's a bait that lures you out like a fish in hiding is the idea. And here it is, a shiny object. And you go down, okay, there it is. And I'll, I'll use a different one. You know, you, you go, I'm going to start dieting. You know, yay, yay, yay. And then all of a sudden you're doing great. And then all of a sudden you see that thing that you really like. Well, there it is. It's like, like, oh no, what do I do? Will I do this or will I do that? Well, what is that that activates it? That's desire. You want that. All right? That's where we have to be alert to our desires. We have to be aware of it. What's motivating us? And so it does, everybody has in this world sin in their life still. You have fallen evil desires that are hostile to God. That's who you are. But you're born again, meaning you have another power in your life, the power of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can test what is of God, the will of God, and not. So that you go through life, oh, you know, you, you make a mistake, oh, and you learn about it, and then it becomes a transforming thing. But the ultimate thing is you want to do God's will. And you want to be transformed. Now, going back to this idea, when that comes, let's go back to diet. Most people can, you know, get into that one. Here it is. Wow, there's that cookie. There's that whatever. I don't care what it is. Some people are salt people. And they go, Shh, oh, well, here it comes. What do I do? Well, there's a choice right there. You either yield to the power of that desire, or you go, I have to die to that. I have to say no. Now, this is what people don't understand in the Bible. And I'm, this is not on the lesson, but this is theology. Romans chapter 6. This was very important. How do we deal with sin? Okay. Let's go back to a male thing. And here comes some woman right there. She's propositioning you. All right. <laughs> That's the real world. Okay. So there you are right there. Okay. She's and the devil's there one way or another. And your view, your whatever flesh is activated. And so you recognize that. And you recognize that power in you. How do you deal with it? You go, oh, no, no, no. I can't do that. I don't want to do that. No, 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 no. I don't want to do See, that's law. Law is death. That's your own power. Romans 6, and this is very important, is what are you? You died to sin. That means that person comes to me, and there they are, and the transaction that takes place within my mind is, I'm dead to that. It doesn't mean anything. I choose to be dead to that. I don't deal with that. I don't engage with it. The word Mich my wife, Michelle, and I use, the Velcro. You know, there it is. The Velcro tries to stick onto you. You go, no, no Velcro, no engagement. Because I'm dead. When you don't engage it, when you are dead to it, it's ineffective. When you try to engage it and work against it, it becomes, remember that old Br'er Rabbit thing, you know, where you get in the you know, tar baby, and the more you deal with the tar baby, it gets worse and worse and worse. That's the way sin works, by the power of your own flesh. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit to say, I am dead, 
And by the power of Jesus Christ, I am choosing to be like Jesus, to obey Jesus. And what is the motivation? Not because I love, you know, dying. It's because I love Jesus. And when you love Jesus, you will die. And when you love Jesus and die, then you will move into fullness of life. That event is like a battleground that will be taken ground in your life. And guess what? God will move you on to another thing. I think, see a question. Say that again. Yes, correct. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. See, sanctification is the word to be made holy. It's a big word. It's simple. Okay, and this is where I think it's important to understand the, what we're saying in uh, our church about what discipleship is. Three aspects, follow, form, fulfill. You become a follower of Jesus, and that's your whole life. But you're born again is when you truly become a follower because your heart is transformed to become, he's my Lord. I'm now following him. I'm not just a religious person. I'm following him personally. Form. You are being transformed, your character. That is a whole lifetime process in this world. And what does that mean? You're not perfect. You know, like the old, the old saying is, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. Well, really, we need to turn around. We need to understand God. Please be patient with me. I'm not finished with you yet. You know, we're going, oh, God, what's going on here? Why, why am I in this mess? You know, what's going on? You know, what's it? Well, the whole thing is we're impatient with God because God is using the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties, frankly, suffering to change us so that our hearts ultimately yearn for him most of all so that we become like Jesus Christ. And what is the purpose of that? Not, well, it's salvation in the ultimate way, because salvation is from the penalty, presence, and power. The purpose of that is this, that you will be prepared to reign forever with Jesus. That's God's purpose. And if you're not under the rule of Jesus in this world, you won't be in the world to come. If you're not seeking more and more to be transformed to do his will in this world, you're not being prepared. Now, it's not perfect. No, don't think of that. But that's the trajectory. That's the desire of your heart. That's the longing of your heart. I want to be like Jesus, to become more and more like him. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Transform me. I want to read your word to know you, to know what you are like. I want to be with God's people where the Holy Spirit is, where God's presence is, where there are holy people who are being examples, who are helping me become more and more like Jesus. That's why we need revival. Because when the Holy Spirit withdraws and people become lukewarm, they just, you know, and then where's, the, where's God on earth? And people go, is this all there is? When you're in revival, I, I said, I'm preaching here, but I saw a thing on, I, think, I saw a thing the other, this weekend on Field of Dreams, you know, that movie, it's a worldly movie about mystical things and, you know, they the guy, you know, it's all father issues and fulfillment and stuff, which is good stuff. But the, the, you know, I'm not against it. I'm just saying, you know, that's the world. And at the end of the movie, the last line was this. The guy that was the producer, I think, was asked, because, you know, when they made the movie, they just thought it was going to be a movie. And then they never knew it would become, it's a wonderful life kind of movie, okay? And so somebody, he said, well, somebody asked me, what does it feel like to have your dreams fulfilled? He said, I don't know. He said, this is so far beyond what I ever dreamed. I couldn't even imagine. Does that make sense? Yeah. What God is doing is so far beyond what we can imagine. Eye has not seen or ear heard nor has entered in the hearts. And what's it all about? It's you. It's you being made like Jesus so that you will reign. You are his possession so that you will reign forever and ever with him. So I have a little problem with your faith because you tell yourself that you're dead to that. Because you're not dead to that. So I know you and your teacher well enough to say that it's a little bit more than that. I mean, I think it's what you have to do 
filled with the fear and you know and then you just pray. Lord, I'm the only person that ever is right here. I need your help. And it wouldn't be a very fast. Yeah, I agree with that. But the, but the thing is, well, yes and no. Because the Bible says you're dead to sin. Right. So it says you're dead to sin. So what what it is is your flesh is still, but who your identity truly is. Okay, let's say this. You're in a marriage and you're tempted to commit adultery. There it is. You have a choice. What's your true identity? What's your true commitment? It's not that you're not activated because you're tempted. Period. That's what a temptation is. So that's a lie. That's the flesh. But if you go, this is my true identity. This is who I am. I choose to love my spouse. I choose to be faithful to God. That's who I am. Okay, I'm not going that way. So my identity is to choose to be dead to that. Because God says that. And you have the power to choose that. Because of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Yes. Well, it's not magic. It's not magic and it's not self-talk because if all it is is in your soul, you're not in the spirit. That's like a, an appliance saying, I'm going to make toast, I'm going to cook toast, and it's never been plugged in. you got to be plugged into the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to be, this is why Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, but that's not in context. Okay, I'm talking about Romans 7. That's one of the worst interpreted passages of the Bible. People go, well, I want to sin, but I, you know, Paul said, I don't have time to go into it. But Romans 7, as it begins, the law is for, I mean, the law is for spiritual people, but I am a flesh person. So the whole, see, Romans 6 says what? You're dead to sin. Romans 8 says you're set free from sin. Romans 7 says you're a slave of sin. Well, which one is it? You know, if people go, well, I'm a slave to sin. Well, you're a Roman 7 person, which Paul says is a flesh person. Who will set me free from this bondage of sin? Okay, that's not an issue of, okay, here, here I want to sin. That's Galatians chapter 5. You desire to do sin. Flesh, you know, wants to sin. Hello, that's the real world. Don't walk according to in the power in obedience to the flesh walk according to in obedience to the power of the spirit and if you don't experientially know what that means you have to start learning what the christian life is really about it's not knowledge it's not information it's power 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 of death to life power of the holy spirit living in your life you being set free continually to be made alive to Christ in an obedience to him. And this, that's what it is. And so that's every single day and really every single moment. And it's depending on the context. You can be on the mountaintop. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And then you go, in the, where did all this come from? Because God is not finished with you yet. Amen? Amen. Okay. Okay. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to get into this. <laughs> I'll just say this. So please take this. Uh, I want to emphasize what happens is that in every culture, uh, there's issues. Now, on page two, it talks about the two primary issues in the New Testament. And as you'll notice, false doctrine was dealt with in every book of the, of the New Testament except one. Most people don't know that. Look at Jesus' statement. How will you escape being sentenced to hell? Well, that ain't nice words. This is heaven and hell issues. And he's speaking to these Bible believers, okay, professing Pharisees. You know, they really didn't believe, but anyway. So you can read all that. Okay, now the two primary issues addressed in the New Testament, and it's not the only one, it's the primary one. First of all, it's what's called licentiousness. That means a license to sin. That's where we are in our culture. Okay, that means this for Bible believing people. I'm a Christian. I'm saved by grace. I'm on my way to heaven. It really doesn't matter how I live. Okay, that means you have a license to sin. 
You can have a license to do your own thing. And people have this false doctrine. Well, there's three categories of people, a non-Christian, a real Christian, and a carnal Christian. I mean, a category, not that Christians don't live in the flesh, but a category. Here's a guy who's, this is a true story. Sproul talks about this, how he had past a relationship with this one guy who was on drugs. He's living in total sexual sin. He goes to him. Oh, no, it's actually a friend of his, a pastor, went to him and, and started saying, look, at, you're not, if you're living like this, the Bible doesn't, the Bible says you're not going to go to heaven. That's what it says. And he goes, well, I'm a carnal Christian. Meaning I'm on my way to heaven, but I'm living in the flesh. That guy is cursed of God. I can get into it, but if, specifically in Deuteronomy, it says anybody who says they have grace and then they go out and live in utter rebellion against God, they are under the wrath of God. They're turned over to their sin. They're so deceived. Now, that's what's going on in our church. That church, not our church, but one way or another, because it affects us. Every issue comes back to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? Now, this is where the sex thing is so important, because idolatry and sex almost always go together. When you turn away from the truth of who God is and God's Word, almost historically, categorically, it has to do with people wanting to move out from the will of God in terms of their sexual lives and their relationships to one way or another doing what is disapproved of God. And so their conscience knows. The Bible says this, I will be held accountable by God for living this because I'm, as Romans says, I know I'm living in rebellion against God, but they go, I don't want that God. I want a different God. I want a nice God. I want a tolerant God. I want a God who forgives me for whatever I do, that I can just do my own thing and I'm going to go to heaven when I die and I'll live forever in Disneyland of whatever it is. That's a lie of the devil. All right. And this is what the, the war is. The difference between this church and the church denomination that we left, the battlefield was on homosexuality, if you remember. No, 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 that's not true. That's not my point. The battlefield was on homosexuality. The material war was on scripture. See, you're, you're, we're saying the same thing, but see, the issue is what does the Bible say? That's the ultimate issue. But the battle was, you could go back in history. It could be abortion. It could be, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. Those are battlefields. The ultimate issue is the word of God. Okay, it is what does the word of God say about this issue today in this controversy? And that's why those people said, forget the word of God. We're going to interpret the way we want because we have, look at um, the middle of this page two, verse Revelation 2.20, these are the words of God Almighty, the Son of God, against the church. But I have this against you. That's not very nice, Jesus. That you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. In other words, here she is, somebody respected. I'm teaching God's word and is teaching and seducing my servants to do what? Practice, Practice to do immorality. Now, what does Jesus say is the open door to that evil tolerance that's always the seduction oh we're tolerant you know just look go back in history look at all the old movies way back in the 30s whatever it's like tolerance it's all the devil okay now there's a holy tolerance of what is non-essential ephesians chapter 4 says you know bear one another tolerate is, is a, another word i mean there's certain things that are not essential okay really there's certain things that are they're heaven and hell. Those are the things where Jesus is putting his finger on. Idolatry, sexual sin. When you read the book of Revelation or three times in Paul's epistles, Paul three times says, if anybody lives like this, they're not going to go to heaven or they're not inheriting the kingdom of God. They're going to hell. You look at the book of Revelation, how many times it says people who are put in the lake of fire were sexually immoral. They worshiped demons. They did evil. But one of the major things is that they were sexually immoral. We're at the end of the world, at the end of the age, because of what's going on. I'll just say that. But this is the war, all right? This is the war where the battlefield is. And ultimately, it's like, will we believe Jesus and his word and the power of the Holy Spirit? And will we pay the consequences? If you were in Nazi Germany, 
1934, 35, 36, what choice would you be making where the quote unquote church is now worshiping Hitler? Seriously, asking Hitler to come into your life, giving allegiance to Hitler, and the quote unquote confessing church is now being persecuted and marginalized, going to prison camps and dying. Where are we going to stand? That's where people are around the world. Persecution, you know, all over the world. I don't need to go into that, but that's what's going on. Uh, we're almost done here. But let me make one other thing. Um, at the end of this, I want to point out that they have this uh, controversy rise up to Jerusalem Council. They deal with it. How do they deal with it? All right. They deal with it in three ways. Okay. They're in, what's the interpretation of Scripture? The first way, and this is often not understood, they look at what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, see, we live in a world that are, is evangelical, and so it's like, well, what does the Bible say? So that settles it. The Bible said it. That settles it. But see, this is where you just don't get it. You know, that's your interpretation of the Bible. What was at stake was the interpretation. The Pharisees believed in the Bible. They weren't saying, no, they're saying this is what the Bible says. So how do we know? The first thing is what the Holy Spirit is doing. Manifest, and you must, we must know what the Holy Spirit is. So look at the testimony when you have time. This is why Peter says, God chose me to be the first one to bring God's word. How? Well, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I got a vision. I followed these guys. The Holy Spirit said, I went to this guy's house, Cornelius, and uh, I enter in. I go, well, I'm not kosher, but I guess I'm supposed to come in here. And so I start preaching the gospel to these Gentile people. And when that happens, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit fell. He didn't go, oh, well, this is in the Bible. He goes, the Holy Spirit fell. He goes back to Jerusalem. They're going, what are you doing in a Gentile house? He says, the Holy Spirit fell upon us. Oh, I guess God has granted repentance. You go into Paul's testimony, Barnabas. Barnabas and Paul are telling them the works that God did in the Gentiles. Why? Because it's those works that bear witness from the Holy Spirit. Now, how do we apply that? We preach the word. We need the power. We need the works. You know, would be to God we had more healings. I remember David Booman standing up in the pulpit and saying, so-and-so is here, healed here. So-and-so is healed here. So-and-so and healed. May that happen more and more in our lives. May the power of God, may those people walk in the church, walk in and go, God is here. That's what we want. That's ultimately what it's about. And that's what God wants to do. We are his people created in Christ for good works, saved by grace, so the Holy Spirit can be filling us more and more, that corporately people walk in and they go, God is there. Amen? Let's pray. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Lord, I know, <laughs> uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our lives, give us insight and understanding of what your word says. Lord, in the name of Jesus, as you prayed, Paul, and your word says, open the eyes of our hearts that we may know the power that is ours in Jesus Christ. So I pray for this, and I thank you for this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.